know, two things I'm assured of. One is that God has all power, and the second is that God answers prayer. Do you believe that? God has all power, and God answers prayer, which means that if you have a need today that's not being filled or not being fulfilled, it might be because you're not praying about it. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And sometimes we go without simply because we do not go to the Lord in prayer on a regular basis, seeking His face, calling upon His name to be able to receive the answers that we need. I believe prayer is the native breath of the believer. I believe that we should pray without ceasing, that it should be our lifestyle, not just times we set aside to pray, but throughout the day. We should be people of prayer. Especially as Christians, we should be people of prayer who call upon the name of the Lord. And prayer is simply communicating with God. Don't try to make it too technical. Don't make it too complex. I've had people say, well, I don't know how to pray. Listen, do you know how to talk? If you know how to talk, then you know how to pray. Because prayer is simply communicating with God. It's speaking to God but let me remind you, it's also listening to God. And sometimes we're so busy telling God what we need and telling God what we want that we forget that maybe God has something to say to us as well. And so prayer is not only speaking to God, but it's also listening to God. And so today I'd like to share a message on the subject of prayer. And so if you have your Bible, take it and turn over to Matthew chapter 20. And I'd like to read verses 29 through 34, a story about Jesus' miraculous power. How Jesus was able to restore the sight of two blind men. Now you think about all the physical infirmities in, in the world. Blindness has to be one that would be so unbelievable to experience. That you cannot see the world around you that you cannot see what is in front of you. And some people are born blind even, that they've never been able to see color, that they've never been able to see a beautiful sunset. And yet here is Jesus having the power to restore their sight. So let's look together. Matthew chapter 20, and let me begin reading with verse 29. It says, As as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity or in mercy, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. By the way, this same story is also found in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, and then also in Luke chapter 18. And it's in Mark that we discover that one of these blind men, his name was Bartimaeus. And you might say, well, why are there two blind men in Matthew and only one blind man in Mark and one blind man in Luke? Well, there's no discrepancy here. I mean, just think about this. What if today two people were saved? It would be a glorious uh, experience, and you might go out today and say, two people were saved this morning at church. But maybe you knew one of them by name. Maybe one of them was your relative or one of them was your friend and you went out today and you said, hey, Steve got saved today and you didn't mention the other one. Is that a discrepancy? No, you didn't say only Steve was saved. You simply said Steve was saved. And so in Matthew, you have two blind men, but in Mark you have one and in Luke you have one, but actually two blind men were healed that day, one whose name was was Barnabas. I believe that there are various principles we can learn from this passage about how to pray. And as I've talked with people down through the years as a pastor, 
I have found out that a lot of people do not feel very good about their prayer life. Now you think about yourself. If you had to rate your prayer life on a scale of 1 to 10, what number would you give it? I don't think there would be many of us today who would say, I'm going to give it a 10. I think most of us realize that we have a lot of room for growth when it comes to prayer. But in this passage, we have some tips on how to pray effectively. One of them is pray persistently. I believe that we need to persist in prayer. Think about these two blind men. They cried out to Jesus. They called upon his name. They said, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And what did the crowd around them do? They tried to quiet them. They said, hush. Don't bother the master. Don't interrupt his plans. They tried to quiet these blind men, and yet it says that they continued to cry out to Jesus. They continued to seek him and his mercy. Look at verse 31. It says, The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. They persisted in prayer. The crowd said, be quiet. The crowd said, don't bother Jesus. They ignored the crowd. They ignored the noise around them, and they continued to pray, and they continued to seek Jesus. We too need to persist in prayer. You know, it says over in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And as you read in the original, it means ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Not just ask once. Not just seek every now and then. Not just knock once, but continue to knock. We are to seek the face of God persistently and not let obstacles stand in our way. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. But you know, I find in my own life, and I'd say it's true in your life, that there are a number of obstacles when it comes to prayer. We set our mind to pray. We say we're going to pray at this time each day, or we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this afternoon. And there are certain obstacles that present themselves when you make a commitment to prayer. I want to talk about two of them. One is busyness. You think people are busy today? You know, we have all these devices, uh, smartphones, and we have our iPads, and we have our, you know, we have our computers at home, and they're supposed to make life easier. They're supposed to make life simpler, and yet sometimes they make life more complex. You know, I remember when I was here before, back in the 90s, at least some of that time, I didn't have a cell phone. And so if I wanted to go out to Camp Lebanon fishing, or I wanted to go to the mall, I knew that I could be totally without distraction. I could just go and enjoy my day and and do my thing, but now you hear that little beep on the phone. You got an email. You got a text. You got a Facebook message. And we're bombarded on a regular basis. I think some of us seek Facebook more than we seek the face of God. And I'm not against Facebook, but I'm saying that Are we able to set aside social media long enough to be able to commune with Almighty God? Or are we in the time of prayer? Oh, Lord, hang on just a second. I got another text. Hang on a second. I got another like. I need to check and see who liked what I said today. Or are we saying I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to draw near to God. I'm going to commune with God and not be distracted. You know what the word busy means? Being under Satan's yoke. Busy. Being under Satan's yoke. And some of us are so busy that we don't have time to spend with God. You remember the story at the conclusion of Luke chapter 10? Mary and Martha. Remember those two sisters? Jesus went over to their house one day and he was a guest. And Martha was like many of you. She wanted to make sure her house was all straightened and she wanted to fix him a meal and she was busy doing this and busy doing that. And her sister was simply sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she came in and she was aghast 
and said, Lord, tell my sister to help me. I'm in here trying to fix you a meal, and she's in here sitting at your feet. What did Jesus say? He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but there's only one thing that's needful, and Mary has chosen the better way. You know, a little comical story, uh, D.L. Moody, the, the evangelist that preached to, to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, I don't know if you know this, but he was a big old man. He was a big old man who loved to eat, and someone asked him one time, who would you rather have as your companion, Mary or Martha? Who would you rather be married to, Mary or Martha? He said, well, before dinner, I'd like to have Martha, but after dinner, I'd like to have Mary. But he still wanted that meal. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being busy in the service of God. But if our service to God takes away from our communion with God, then something's wrong. And we pastors and Sunday school teachers and church leaders, we can become so busy in our service to God that we don't really take time to commune with God. And you were saved not simply to serve God, you were saved to have a relationship with God. And so busyness is an obstacle. I believe another obstacle is simply self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. We don't feel like we need prayer, right? Prayer is not our first option. Prayer is our last resort. I'll try this. I'll call this person, I'll seek this advice, and then if I can't find any other solution, then I will turn to God in prayer. Self-sufficiency. And let me tell you something, none of us is self-sufficient. Every hour I need thee. That's what the hymn writer said. Every hour I need thee. I need God, you need God, and if you're not praying, and you're not praying on a regular basis, it could be because of self-sufficiency. You don't think you need the Lord. But I want you to know something. No prayer is too big for God, and no prayer is too small for God. No prayer. You know, we've transferred everything over now. We are officially Buckeyes now. I mean, we have, we have the Ohio license plate. We have the Ohio driver's license. I mean, we have it all now. But my wife, it took her a little bit longer than me because she was looking for her social security card. She had to take it down to the DMV. She couldn't find it. She said she hid it somewhere so no one could find it, <laughs> but she hid it so well that even she couldn't find it. She searched and she searched. Turned the whole house upside down. Found some other things that maybe she hadn't seen before. But, you know, finally I said, honey, you're just going to have to pray about it. And she said, I am praying about it. But she began to pray about finding her Social Security card. You say, why would you pray about that? Nothing's too big for God. Nothing's too small for God. And she looked about everywhere. And then Savannah in her room began to cry and so she went in Savannah's room and then realized she hadn't checked in Savannah's room. And then there it was, I think in the closet. She found the Social Security card, was able to go and get her license. And so, listen, God answers prayer. God answers prayer. And don't think, well, God's so busy and he's running the world. He doesn't have time for this small little prayer. God has time for any prayer that you bring to him. So pray persistently. Well, a second tip I would give you on prayer is pray specifically. Specifically. These two blind men told Jesus exactly what they wanted. Look at verses 32 and 33. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Now let me ask you a question today. If Jesus were to appear, and he was here right this morning, and he were to say to you as an individual, not to your spouse, not to your children, not to anyone around you, but if he would say directly to you, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say this morning? 
Would you even know what to say? Jesus said to these two blind men, What do you want me to do for you? He asked them a question. You know what they said? They said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Very specifically, they told God what they wanted and what they needed. I believe our prayers are too general. They're way too general. Lord, bless my family. Bless me. Bless my church. Bless the nation. Bless the poor. And bless the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me ask you this. How do you even know if God answered that prayer? How do you know if he blessed you, your family, etc.? What about praying a little more specifically? Lord, I pray this for my family. I pray this for my church. I pray this for my nation. I pray this for the poor. I pray this for the world. And therefore, when God answers that specific request, you can turn back and say, thank you, God, for answering this prayer. Pray specifically. I love to hear a child pray. I really believe that some children can pray more effectively than adults. You know why? Because children have pure hearts. And children have faith. And when they talk to God, they just pray very directly and very specifically, this is what I want you to do, God. And they actually expect God to do it. They expect God to do it. You know, when I left uh, town back in 2001, I moved to to an apartment in Cincinnati. And it was an old duplex. It really wasn't that nice of a place, but it was a place to live while while I finished out a degree there in Cincinnati. And I hadn't been there too long until I discovered there were mice in that apartment. And man, back then, I was terrified of mice. I would have rather there have been a cobra or a rattlesnake in that apartment than mice. Now, I'm really not that afraid of mice now, but I guess I've grown as a person but back then I was afraid, and I put the mouse traps out, and I caught a mouse here and caught a mouse there. And then I had a family come over one night for dinner, and they had children. And before they left, as we usually do, we would join in a circle of prayer. And one of the children, his name is Josh, and we, we went around the circle and we prayed. And I told him about the mice and how it was bothering me. And he, when we prayed, we, we were joined in hands. And he just said, Lord, you know how Brother Mark doesn't like mice. And I just pray that there will not be another mouse in this apartment in Jesus' name. And, you know, I thought, but I hadn't prayed that. I mean, I went out and got traps, but I didn't pray that there would be no more mice. But let me tell you, as he prayed that, I said, I'm not going to find another mouse. There's not going to be another mouse. I knew, I knew when he prayed that. I had my traps out, and finally I took my traps up because after weeks I couldn't, there, were, there, there was no more mice. Never saw another one. Now, if you need him, I can give you his phone number if you want him to come <laughs> over to your house. You don't need to buy any traps or do anything like that. I don't know if he specializes in other uh, pests, but at least with mice. But he prayed with faith. And God heard his prayer. You say, oh, that's just a coincidence. You had already caught all the mice. Listen, I like what one bishop said. He said, when I pray, coincidence happen. And when I don't pray, they don't happen. You get the point? Listen, that's not a coincidence. That was an answer to prayer. And so pray specifically. Third thing I would say to you is pray expectantly. Expect God to answer your prayers. In Mark 10, 52, the parallel passage, it says, And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on on the way. Your faith has made you well. How many times in the Synoptic Gospels does it say that? Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. Let it be to you according to your faith. We need to pray expectantly. Listen, I believe many of us, we're surprised Not when God doesn't answer our prayers. We're surprised when God answers our prayers. We pray, we pray, we pray, God answers. Well, I I can't believe it. This really works. Well, of course it works. Look at Matthew 21, verse 22. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. If you have faith, you have to believe. 
And listen, we need faith in Jesus' mercy and in his might, in his love and in his power. Notice verse 34, it talks about the pity or compassion of Jesus. And we see his power by his ability to heal the blind man. Look at Psalm 62, verses 11 and 12. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. I love that verse. God has all power and God has all love. And you need both. If you're going to be God, you need both. Because if he had all power and he didn't have all love, he could help you, but maybe he wouldn't want to. And if he had all love, but he didn't have all power, maybe he wanted to help you, but he doesn't have the resources to help you. But you see how love and power go together? He has all power, which means he can meet any need that you have. But he also has all love, which means he wants to meet any need that you have. And so when we go to God, we go to a God that has all power, a God that has all love. Notice that these blind men, how do they refer to Jesus? Three times in this passage, they called him Lord. Verse 30, Lord, have mercy on us. Verse 31, Lord, have mercy on us. Verse 33, Lord, let our eyes be open. And in this passage, it's not a way of referring to him as sir. They're saying, you're the Lord. You're the Lord. These blind men, they had never seen Jesus with their physical sight. They just heard he was passing by, and no, no doubt they heard rumors of his ability to heal and to restore. And they said, this is our opportunity. And they began to cry out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. They knew that the Lord could meet their need. They prayed expectantly. We need to expect God to answer our prayers. Now, I want to address something. This doesn't mean that God always answers our prayers the way we want him to or when we want him to. He doesn't always do that. We've seen that recently in our church with little Nicholas Minor. You know, I stood beside him up at the Children's Hospital in Dayton. It was one of the hardest things to do was to see that little three-year-old boy and lay my hand on him and pray for him. And I can tell you that I mustered all the faith that I have. All the faith that I have. And I prayed and said, Lord, please heal him. Please let his eyes open. Please, God, bring him up from this bed of affliction. And I walked out of that room believing God. But you know, God chose to heal him in another manner. He chose to heal him in another manner. Someone recently came up to me and said, I don't believe in healing any longer. And I said, why? And they said, because God didn't heal Nicholas. I don't believe in healing any longer. Listen, God did heal him. His brain activity now is working. He has no bruises. He has no broken bones. And, and I know that may not be the greatest comfort to the family. And if I were in their shoes, I would totally understand that. But God has healed him. And he is with Jesus in heaven. And as a parent, if that were my child, I do not know how you could get through that other than knowing that your child is in the arms of Jesus. And where if, I, if he couldn't be in my arms, if he couldn't be in my arms, I'd rather him be in the arms of Jesus than anyone else's arms in the world or my wife's in the arms of Jesus. And so God doesn't always heal the way we want him to or, or how we want him to. But listen, God always answers prayer. His ways are higher than our ways. We live in a fallen world. We're not home yet. And some things, a, a pastor and as a Christian, we just have to say, I don't understand. I don't understand why these things happen. But I know God is love. And I know God is all powerful. And I still believe in prayer. And I still believe in divine healing. But one last thing. And that is pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. We see this in verses 30 and 31. You see the crowd. They, they tried to stop them from praying. 
But it says in verse 31, they cried out all the more. Or as one translation says, they cried out all the louder. I mean, at first it was, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And then it was, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. I mean, they were crying at the top of their lungs, pleading with Jesus to come and to heal them. You see, they prayed earnestly. Let me ask you, do you pray earnestly? Do you seek God with all of your heart? The Bible says you will search for me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. It says in James chapter 5 and verse 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A fervent prayer. And we need to be earnest and fervent in our prayers. And let me tell you a sign of your sincere prayers. It's this, that when God answers your prayer, you're not done with God, you're just beginning with God. We do not use God as someone we simply come to and, Lord, I need your help. Okay, you've helped me, and now I go back to life as usual. And now I go back to being self-sufficient. Now I go back to ruling and conducting my own life. No, how does this passage end? And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And followed him. They were healed, they received their sight, and then they became devoted followers of of Jesus. We're not just praying, well, Lord, give me what I need, give me what I want, and now I'll go back to life as usual. No, we are to follow the Lord with a sincere heart, receiving answers to our prayers, but not just to get answers to our prayers, but to follow Him on a daily basis. You see, we need His help. We need His help every day, not just in the big moments of crisis, but every day. And, and listen, I believe the ultimate miracle in this passage You say, what's the miracle in this passage? I believe the ultimate miracle in this passage was not them receiving their sight. It was that they followed him. Listen, the greatest miracle is not physical healing. The greatest miracle is salvation. That's the greatest miracle. You say, well, that's not that big of a miracle. Well, if you don't think it's that big of a miracle, then you do not know humanity apart from the grace of God. Humanity, apart from the grace of God, will never seek the face of God, will never repent of sin, will never turn from their wicked ways, will never receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God must touch your heart. God must convict you of your need. God must open your eyes, not just your physical eyes, but your spiritual eyes. The greatest miracle was not that these men received their sight. It was the last part of this passage, and followed him the greatest miracle was not healing the greatest miracle was salvation and when you're saved he does open your eyes and you can see you know the funny thing after you're saved really life is the same outside of you but it sure looks a lot different doesn't it the sun the you know the the sunset looks more beautiful Your spouse looks more beautiful. Church seems more enjoyable. Reading the Bible seems more gratifying. Listen, everything outside of you is the same. You are the one that's changed. God has helped you to see. And so how do we pray? Well, we learn from this passage that we pray persistently. We pray specifically. We pray expectantly and we pray earnestly. We're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. I want you to stand with me this morning. We're going to have a season of prayer. We're going to have a time of seeking the Lord. This isn't just a message for you to take notes and tuck it away in your Bible. This is a message to apply. This is a message to put into practice. I've asked four couples to come up front today and they're going to be stationed here to pray about various needs that you might have. Woody and Gail Crossway, if you'd come forward, they're going to be over here. They're going to pray with anyone that has a physical need. You need healing in your body. 
you have someone that you know that needs healing in their body, you can come over here. <coughs> They'll anoint you with oil. They'll pray with you. Brian and Jody Watson will be over here. Brian is our youth pastor. You have a family need, an issue in your family. Whatever it is, maybe it's a son or grandson that needs the Lord. Maybe it's a marriage that needs to be restored. Maybe you want to be a better father, a better mother. You can come and see Brian and Jody. They'd love to pray with you. Tim and, R Tim and Rhonda will also be over here. They just want to pray for those who'd like to draw closer to God. You want a closer relationship with God. You need to enhance your prayer life, your Bible reading. You, you just want to draw near to God. Then Jenny and myself will be over here. We're going to pray for anyone that needs to be saved or you're, you're saved but you want spiritual breakthrough. Man, you just want to break through. There's been an addiction. There's been a need. There's just been something that you've struggled with for too long and you're ready today to lay it down and to be set free in the name of Jesus. You say, well, you didn't mention what I'm going through. You can come to any, any one of us for whatever need you have. And when you come, you don't have to tell the whole story. Just stand in line and specifically ask what you need. We're going to pray for you. We're going to see God work. Father, consecrate this time of prayer. Consecrate this time of prayer. Miracles are going to happen today, we pray, as we call upon your name. In Jesus' name.